If you're joining us online, we want to say we're, we're glad that you're part of our family. You're part of the That Church family. You're, you're in with us. Um, some, some months ago, we, we saw a couple of hits on our, our podcast, some folks watching in, in Tibet, believe it or not. So if you're in Tibet, we think that's really cool. Um, would you send us a note and say, hey, I'm watching, you know, if you can? Uh, you know, that's awesome. So praise God for that. We're excited about that. So um, it's good to be here today. It's good to be with you guys. We're starting a brand new series, um, Left Behind. And we're going to be discussing God's timeline today. And I'm going to try to tell you everything that I can in the, the time that I'm going to be given. Um, we are going to be coupling this with a, going to the movies together. There's a new uh, movie coming out. I have not yet seen it. Um, sometimes they let pastors preview these things, but they haven't let us do this one. So I don't know what it looks like, but it looks pretty doggone good. And so I, I'm kind of excited about seeing that. But I thought it'd be a great time for us to at least begin looking at God's timeline. How many of you would say right now that that you feel like as you look at world events and as you kind of look at the news and you look at some of the unrest and the craziness and stuff, how many of you would say right now that you feel kind of it, the, it, things seem different right now? They, it, you know, Not really saying where we are, but it just seems unique. We're living in a, in a very unique time. I sense more anxiety from people right now, more unrest, more fear um, than I can ever remember um, from being a pastor. There's just some stuff that's happening. Um, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time trying to figure out what that looks like. And today we're going to focus specifically on God's timeline. And I want to just spend some time telling you really what you need to think about with God's timeline. And this is the timeline. This is kind of how it's laid out. And this is actually in order. And, and we'll be referring back to this throughout there. Here's what I want to say is this series is going to be a lot like geometry. So I'm just preparing you on the front end that we're going to be referring to this timeline throughout the whole series. So today I'm not going to cover all this. There's no way. Um, not unless we had like a few hours and, and we don't. Um, so, because the 1130 people would be upset because they can't get a parking space because your car is in their spot. And uh, so anyway, but we're going to do all that we can. I think there's a whole lot for us to understand. Um, we're going to use the book of Revelation today as, as kind of a guide to understanding the timeline. You know, I hear people say, well, Scott, the book of Revelation is very complicated and it's very difficult. In fact, a lot of contemporary pastors won't even attack this subject, in which I think is sad. Because the truth is, is that God wants us to know about his timeline. He wants us to know about the fact that the future is within his hands. And uh, why we want to avoid this subject, I, I don't really know. Um, but we're not going to because it's part of God's word. And we're going to adventure into that and we're going to see what we can learn together. I do want to say this is at least a disclaimer on the front end. There is nobody on planet earth that fully understands all of God's timeline and exactly how events will go down. Nobody has that. Um, so what I'm going to do is the best of my understanding, I'm going to share with you how, how I believe that it plays out. And I'm going to use scripture to confirm that. Not just my word, but we're going to use God's word to confirm that. But I want to say this. If we get into this timeline and there's a part that you go, oh, wait a second. You know, I heard the guy on TV with big hair says it goes this way, and I think it should go this way. Well, that's all right. Settle down, you know. Don't skip your medicine over it. We'll figure it out as we kind of go along. It's not a big deal. Not a big deal. Um, the subject of God's Word, without a doubt, is Jesus, and that's what we're going to focus on, and we're going to continue to focus on that. So, um, so without any further ado, let's jump into this together. Um, the book of Revelation is difficult to understand just because of the apocalyptic language. It uses symbols and pictures. And so that makes it kind of hard to understand. You know, there's a dragon that represents something. There's, you know, so forth and so on. And so that makes it complicated. But I want to assure you, one of the reasons why we want to use the book of Revelation as we kind of understand God's timeline is of all the books in all the Bible, it is the most organized book. Chronologically, it is in perfect chronological order. And we're going to let that be sort of the schematic as we plug pieces in as we go through this. And I think you're going to see as we walk into it. But even the book of Revelation and its complexity gives us a key. And if you've got your outlines, I'm going to encourage you to pull those out. If you want to pull your Bibles out, if you want to pull up the Bible on you version, do that, whatever. Um, let's kind of dig in this together and let's look at God's Word together. But Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 is what I would call the key to understanding the book of Revelation, which is the key to helping us kind of understand the events that are, that are laid out and how God has laid them out. And Revelation chapter 1 verse 19, remember John the Apostle is receiving this, this book. He's receiving the words and the imagery for this book. He's getting this from an angel. He's writing it down. Um, and this, this angel gives him specific instructions in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, of what he needs to be writing down and in what order. And here's the order. Revelation 1, 19 says this, Therefore, write the things which you have what? 
All right, so there's something John had seen. In fact, there's someone he's seen, and I'll, we'll, we'll get into that. And, important conjunction, um, the things which what? Which are, that's the age that John was living in at that time. Um, and, and by the way, that age has extended into today. We're still living in the same age. And then there's an, another and, and the things which what? Will take place after these things. And so that's the, that helps you understand. That you'll see that you're going to go, wow, this makes a lot of sense now that it's broken apart that way. So there was first, there was something that John saw. Then there's the, there's the things which are. And then there's the things that are going to happen after the things which are. There's something else in that timeline. That's kind of how we're going to look at the book of Revelation. It's going to, going to help you. So let's start with what it says in verse 19, the things which you have seen. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, incidentally, when we look at the Bible, um, the titles or the names of the books in the Bible are not necessarily inspired. In other words, we added those names, okay, as we were kind of helping ourselves try to understand these books. We put those on there. The, the, the Gospel of John or the book of Hebrews, or, or the book of 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians. We added those names just so we'd know where they were, just so we could kind of understand them. They're not necessarily inspired. Now, the name that's given to the book of Revelation really finds itself in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and it says this. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yours says from Jesus Christ. That's a typo. If you would, mark that out in your outline and put the word of. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And so that's the name of the book of Revelation. Incidentally, the book of Revelation is not the book of Revelations. God has one revelation, and he is revealing one person. In fact, that's my very first point, if you just want to fill in the blank. All present, past, and future is a story about Jesus. God is using human history to roll out the story of his son. And you go, well, Scott, is that really important? It is the utmost importance. Anytime that you hear a teaching on a timeline like this and we're trying to understand future events and the end times and left behind and the rapture and the tribulation, the mark of the beast and all that stuff, anytime we talk about those things, the unfortunate reality is, is that I think very often we talk about them as if those events are the subject. Those, the events of human history are not the subject. Human history itself is not God's subject. God's subject matter is Jesus. You say, well, does that make much difference? Absolutely it does. Because what you're going to understand is you're going to see throughout this timeline, God's painting a picture of Jesus eternal. That's the beginning of the timeline. You're going to find that, that Jesus at the cross, that's Jesus. He is, he is Savior. You're going to see God is pointing a picture of him being Savior. Jesus is the deliverer. You're going to see Jesus in his judgment. He's delivering his judgment and his bride during the same time period. You're going to see Jesus coming back. Jesus is king. And you're going to see Jesus in the very end after the millennial reign. You're going to see that, that God is painting a picture that there is no substitute for Jesus. See, God has made it incredibly clear that the subject of all things is Jesus. And if you lose track of that, it's, you're going to miss some very important things. John, when he was writing his gospel, he subscribed to that same truth. And so he starts off his gospel right off the bat, and he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John says, I want you to kind of understand the start of this whole thing. Now, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 also says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And someone might say, well, is John chapter 1, verse 1, when he says, In the beginning, is he talking about Genesis 1, 1? And I would say, no. I believe John chapter 1, verse 1 is talking about a beginning of whatever. And I think it even predates his understanding is even predating Genesis 1.1. In other words, what I'm saying is, is that when John writes, in the beginning was the word, he's saying that whatever beginning you want to go back to, whether it's the beginning of time, the beginning of human history, the beginning of creation, if you want to go back even further than that, if you want to go back in time and exhaust the imagination and mind that you might have, go as far back as you can possibly imagine, God will already be there. And he will be no older and he will be no younger. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I think John is presenting this one understanding, and it's this at the very beginning of this timeline, is that Jesus is in fact eternal. That's the reason why the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2 says that all things were created by him and for him were all things created. When you hear in Genesis where it says, this voice speaks and says, let there be light, you would recognize that voice as the same voice that shouts from the cross, it is finished. It is none other than Jesus himself. God. It wants you to know and wants me to know that the subject of all things is Jesus. He wants you to know him more. And more than anything else, God wants you to know him. 
And for this reason, your enemy will perpetually play down the importance of Christ. He will constantly demean the importance of Jesus. But for those of us who believe the Scripture and are followers of Jesus, we understand that you cannot take away the crown of Christ and the person of Christ and the deity of Christ and still have Christ. And so we have to make sure he stays in the forefront and the foremost of all it is that we study and understand. All past, present, and future is a story about Jesus. No matter what is a story about Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, here's what Jesus says. He says, I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. You say, the beginning of what? And he says, right. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. The end of what? He says, yep, that's right. You've got it. Remember when Moses was talking to God and he says, who do I say sent me? He says, you tell him I am sent you. I am. Okay. That's good enough for me. See, Jesus is, is letting us know that it's about him. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. And he goes on further and he says this, uh, says the Lord God. Now, this is Jesus speaking. And it's always intriguing to me when I talk to people and they go, well, there's no real place in Scripture where Jesus claims to be God. Are you reading the same Bible I'm reading? He just said, I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. And then it goes on, and the title that's given to him is Lord God. These are two exclusive titles. Lord means he, he deserves perfect obedience. Lord, the title Lord is the relationship between a servant and a master. In other words, when someone would call someone else a Lord, when they would say, well, you are my Lord, and you'll see that throughout Scripture. You're my Lord. My Lord, my Lord told me to do so-and-so. I'm doing what my Lord said. That means that that, that person tells you what to do. And without question, you do it. Jesus said, I am Lord. That means that whatever I ask of you, you do it. You should, because I am Lord. Not only that, he says, God, Lord, God, creator, author of all things. All things are within his power and control. Then he goes on, listen to this. Who is, who was, and who is to come. Even in that statement, Jesus makes this promise. He said, you've seen me. I've been here in the flesh. I died, I was resurrected, but I'm coming again. Now, let me just say this to you. I believe it's one of the largest mistakes that contemporary churches are making, not spending enough time with the understanding and recognition that Jesus has promised that he will return again. I think it's a mistake for us to leave behind a teaching that is so pivotal and important to our future. In fact, the gospel itself, if you see it in its full clarity, it's not just the death, burial, and resurrection, but it is the return of Jesus as well. And that is the scripture, and that's biblically true, and that should cause us to live in certain ways. And you're going to see how it should affect our behavior as we go deeper into this message together. But he says, I'm Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who was, who is, and who is to come. And then he goes on and finishes with the most dramatic, dynamic name of God. He said, I am the, what? Almighty. He says, that's me. Almighty means all power belongs to me. That's who Jesus is. Eternal. God. He is is God. That's who he is. And so right off the bat, we have to understand that God is unveiling his son, the person of his son, that we might know him. And and you say, well, as I look through this timeline, why does that make a bit of difference? It makes a huge difference because if the events are the subject, there's stuff you're going to miss. I think very often you and I read the Bible in that same way. I run into people constantly, and we kind of read our Bible like you would your high school annual. You know what I'm talking about? When you got your high school annual, where was the first place you looked? Yeah, you're looking for your picture. Where am I at? You go to your class pictures, wouldn't you? And you're like, hey, where, where am I at in my class picture? Wait a second, I'm over. There I am. Ooh, ooh. Man, I look heavy in that picture. Gosh, I thought I was thinner than that. See, my high school pictures, I had a mullet. <laughs> there should be a requirement that people doing those pictures should stop everything and say, hey, listen, you've not been alive long enough to know that this is going to haunt you. We're unwilling to let you make a fool of yourself 20 years from now when you're talking to your children. So what we're going to do is we're not going to let you. We're going to cut your hair. We're going to put you on some real clothes. And then we're going to take your picture because you're going to appreciate it later. But you look for yourself, don't you? And then in cl- after you look past the class pictures, where else do you look? You look in the activities. Oh, look, look, I'm, I'm doing the long jump. Looks like I made it like 12 inches there. That's what the pole vault or something. I don't, I don't know. You know, and you look for yourself. To, but that's how we read the Bible, isn't it? We, we tend to turn to the Bible and we go, okay, God, what do you want me to do with my life? God, how should I take care of my marriage? God, what, how, how should I handle this person at work that I want to throttle and beat to death in the parking lot? Okay. 
How do I have happy thoughts when I want to hurt somebody? How do I deal with road rage? How's road? Isn't that what we do? And so we tend to approach the Bible like we do our high school annuals. We look for ourselves in it. And you go, well, Scott, is there a problem with that? There's not unless that's the only way that you approach Scripture. Because, see, the Bible is not a revealing of your life or even God's will for your life. It's not the primary purpose of this book. This book is to reveal God. And see, when I know Jesus, then I have full clarity as to who I am. See, my identity is not wrapped up in my decisions, my good decisions or bad decisions. My identity is wrapped up in who the person of Jesus Christ is and who he is to me. See, I'm not good because I do good. I'm good because the person that this Bible speaks of has made me good. And I want you to understand, we don't worship the Bible, just to be clear. And I think that's one of the things that's really important. We worship the one that this Bible concerns itself with. The Bible is important to us because it is important to Jesus. And it reveals Jesus. But this book is about Jesus. It's not about me. But as I find Christ, you know what I find? I discover who I am. As God redefines me, as God opens my eyes to who I am, but as I understand who he is and his great love for me and his passion for me and his purpose for my life, all of a sudden I discover who I am. I don't discover that because I find myself in these pages. I discover that because I find Jesus here. And so God has made it clear that through human history, he wants us to know his son, the eternal son of Jesus, uh, son of God, Jesus Christ. And so the second thing I want to bring to your attention too, and this is the second part of verse 19, Revelation chapter 1, is the things which are. And so we've established that, that the subject and topic of human history is Jesus, but now we have some events that are revealing even more to us about who Jesus is, and we have the cross. I think we're well aware of a, an event that happened 2,000 years ago, aren't we? where a little boy was born in a manger, very obscure place, and he grew up, and somewhere around his 33rd birthday, he gave his life for, for us. Some of you may not know that personally, but maybe today, maybe today you'll get to know the one who hung on this cross because he didn't do that for himself. He didn't even do that for a religion. He did that for you personally. He took upon himself the worst of me, the ugliest, most embarrassing, ridiculous, stupid crazy parts of me and he took that on himself and he died there paying the price for that and I hope that you get to know him that way because I'm going to tell you something my best friend this is the man who hung upon this he's my best friend by far and I'm so excited because today I might get the chance to introduce you to him and I hope I do I hope you get to know him I know that some of you think that you know him but what you really know is something that was said about him and it's something, in some way he was represented. And some of you are in this room and you've been injured by those people who were supposed to represent him, but they misrepresented him. And so you're here today and you kind of limped in here, spiritually crippled in some ways, hard to understand. Some of you walk in this room and when we talk about a heavenly father, it messes you up because your dad wasn't what he was supposed to be. And so you struggle understanding a God that loves you with the kind of love that this man loves you with. But I hope today through the Holy Spirit, God's going to give you clarity to know something about Jesus as Savior. This is the most important truth you'll ever know. It's way more important than being part of any kind of church or religious organization or whatever. It's way more important than, than having a Jesus tattoo. It's way more important than acting good or trying to even be good. You need to know him more than anything else. You need to know him. It makes all the difference. But about 2,000 years ago, God fulfilled a promise that he'd been given to us for a long, long time that Jesus would come into our world, and he did. Jesus came into our world. He was born of a little teenage peasant girl in an obscure place known as a manger. Right among the animals is where he was born. He grew up as a man, gave us lots of words to live by, but more than that, he gave us a death that we could live through so that we might go free. He died upon a cross. When that event happened, and by the way, that's the most significant event in human history. I love when people try to minimize this event. Oh, Jesus, he's not that big of a deal. He's not significant anymore. I just want to remind you that every time you look at your calendar, whether you're in Tibet or Dallas or wherever you are, when you look at that calendar, that calendar is a reference, has a reference point. You know what the reference point is? This man's life, burial, and death, and resurrection. That's the reference point. You are either looking at a calendar that speaks of Jesus before Jesus or after Jesus. He has divided human history. No other religious leader in human history has ever done such a thing. He is the most significant man that has ever existed, like no other. He is not to be compared to any other religious leader or any other great men or women. He is in himself God in the flesh. 
We use a word called incarnate, which means God who came in the flesh, and that is the person of Jesus. And so Jesus came, and when Jesus died upon this cross, when he gave his life, when he was buried, resurrected from the dead, that started a brand new age. Things changed. The calendar was reset. And things changed. And we've been living during that time ever since then. In fact, when, when Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 says the things which are, that's the age that John was living in. Here's the things which are. Which are. By, incidentally, you and I are still living in that same age. This has already happened and we're past this. We're living somewhere in here. We don't know how close to this next event. I'm going to talk about this is a cool event right here, my friends. This is an incredible event. But we don't know how close we are to this event. Some people say, well, I know for sure we're really, really close. No, you don't. The Bible says, God says specifically, nobody knows when, but God the Father. Nobody knows the hour. We can't predict that. We don't know. M maybe we are this close. I don't, maybe we're a breath away from the end. I don't, maybe we're a thousand years from it. I don't know. The one thing I do know is this. Regardless of how close we are to this very next event that's going to alter human history, we have the same mission. If we're very close or we're very far, our purpose is to reveal Jesus to a world that needs a Savior. That's our role. See, sometimes Christians, we get mixed up and you watch these prepper shows. Stop it. You're getting bomb shelters and storing up ammo and other weirdness. How can I can meat? Let me just tell you this. I don't want to upset your preparation, your bug out bag business and all that silliness. All right. If you want to pretend, just say, hey, I'm pretending. It's like, you know, when I was a kid, you know, psh, 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 psh. you want to do that? Fine. But don't mark that up as something that God, what God has told you to do. The church, whether we are under, we're under extreme persecution or whether we were hated or whether we were loved, whether our government embraced us or not, had the same purpose. Preach the gospel. Tell people about Jesus. To share Christ with a world that needs him. That's, that's our job. Whether we're this close or whether this, we're this close, it doesn't matter. Our job stays the same, to share Jesus. And so the second thing that I want to bring to your attention is God's promise. His promises come true in his time. Someone might say, well, man, it's been 2,000 years since this happened. If God was going to do something, wouldn't he have already done something? It, I mean, come on. It's, this is a fairy tale, Scott. Well, there was a prophecy that was spoken of. In fact, Matthew speaks of it in Matthew chapter 1, verses 23. And it says, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. What you may not know is that Matthew is actually quoting a prophet, and his name is Isaiah. And it's Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. That's who Matthew was quoting. That prophecy was 740 years old when it was fulfilled. Now, just to give you an idea of how long ago 740 years was, if you go back just 400 years, America doesn't even exist. 740 years before the event happened, God said it would happen, and it did happen. Just so that you might know, there's not a single promise in Scripture that as, it, as God's timeline has met it, that God hasn't fulfilled. Not a single one. He's been completely faithful. We have so many things that we could go through in, on that end. I don't have time to talk about all those things today, but I'm going to tell you something. God has been completely and perfectly, without fail, faithful to every promise he's ever made. And he's made a promise. One of his promises, you know what it is? I'm coming back, and we're going home, and it's going to be amazing. There's coming a day. It's unannounced. We don't know when it's going to be. It's not on our calendar. It's not published somewhere we can find it. We can't set an alarm for it. Oh, the end of time here. A little bit. Of, doo -doo -doo, you know, it doesn't work like that. But, but Jesus is going to return for his church, for those who know him. And when we drill into this particular event, we call it the rapture. That's a Latin word, which means to be caught up or snatched away. And some of your friends that have been reading articles online will say, well, the Bible never says the word rapture. No, because that's Latin. <laughs> it, the Bible wasn't translated in Latin, all right? So, but it does say caught up or, or translated away or taken up. And we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about some of the arguments that are against the rapture. I believe that the church age that we're living in right now, this is the very next event that we look forward to. Now, I know some of you are like, I'm Bible, I'm a Bible scholar, Scott. I, don't, I think we're going to go through the tribulation. Good luck. I don't think so. Um, and I'll, I think I can present a very compelling argument why I do not believe the church will go through the tribulation. And the primary reason is, is that God is going to use that seven years of hell on earth to redeem Israel. Um, that's his responsibility, and that's a promise he made to Abraham. And I'll reveal that to you. We don't have time to go on that today, and I don't want to confuse you. But I do want you to understand that there's an event coming that's going to be pretty amazing. And it's going to be pretty incredible. Um, and it's known as the rapture. But God's promises concerning the first coming of Jesus. By the way, Jesus spoke more of his second coming than he did his first coming. So that's one of the reasons why I don't understand why we don't want to talk about it. I love talking about it. I love this stuff. People say, well, I don't, you know, let's don't argue about it. I don't mind arguing. 
I like arguing. I got the gift of confrontation. Um, but someone might say, well, what, why is God waiting? If this has happened, then why don't we just go ahead and get to this? Let's get done with this thing. Let's, let's roll this thing up. Let's be finished. Well, 2 Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it's in your outline. It's also going to be on the screen. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, instead he is, what's that word? He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to what? To perish, but everyone to come to repentance, for everyone to know Jesus. See, the last person that God has his eye on to be saved, person or persons, have not committed their life to Christ yet. And so God has pushed pause, and he's waiting. He's waiting for that. You know, he's done that before. There was a prostitute. Her name was Rahab. You'll find her in the Old Testament. It is when the children of Israel were coming in to retake the land. And, and, uh, and, and she has an incredible story. She was part of the Amalekites. The Amalekites had been the enemies of Israel for a very long time. God waits 400 years for this one woman to be born and to grow up and to have a chance to commit her life to God Jehovah. When the spies are sent into the land, the, these Hebrew spies go, she takes them into her home and she hides them and she takes care of them. And she says, when you come back, because I believe in the God that you believe in, when you come back, remember me and my family. Joshua said, we're going to, and we're going to have a party right down here in the street. He didn't say that, but that's what I would have said. But that's basically what happens. So, And sure enough, when they come into the land, they remember Rahab, just a prostitute, a nobody. See, for anybody that, that, that looks at people and they think that performance matters and you've got to be perfect for God to love you and all that stuff, it's interesting that God waits 400 years for a prostitute because he loves her. She's not valuable because she's perfect. She's valuable because he loves her and she matters to him. And he waited on her. And sure enough, he saved her. Incidentally, her name is in the lineage of, the, of Jesus Christ. Isn't that crazy? To think that Jesus hid at a prostitute. Well, a woman who once was a prostitute, who met God, and God redefined her story like we talked about last week. And she's in his lineage. Isn't that cool? Well, let me tell you something. The reason why this hasn't happened yet is God's waiting on somebody. And it may be you. This next event, the event is not the most important thing. This person is the most important thing. And Jesus is a savior first and foremost, and he's waiting. He's waiting for you. So you've been presented with the gospel before, but you've never really said yes to it. Maybe you're kind of religious. Maybe you've got some religious activities in your life, and, and maybe you talk about things, and you go, I'm a Christian, or maybe your mom was a Christian or, or something. Maybe you've got a Jesus tattoo, or you've got some other religious paraphernalia that you kind of hold on to. Maybe you've read the Bible part of it one time in passing or something, but you've never responded to Jesus and put your life in his hands. And take advantage of the forgiveness that he purchased on that cross for you. You've never really done that. God may be waiting just for you. And wouldn't it be cool today for you to say yes? It would be the coolest of cool, I promise you. So he does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's what God's desire is. Now let me give you a final point that I want to bring out. In verse 19, the last part, it says, the things which will take place after these things. In other words, John's living during this church age. Remember, he's living during this church, this, this span from between the cross and this very next event. That's where, but, 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 but the book of Revelation tells us that, you know what? When this happens, there's going to be another group of things that are taking place. Remember I told you the book of Revelation is in perfect chronological order. Revelation chapter 1, we have a picture of Jesus as the high priest. That's what you see, Revelation chapter 1. You, have, you see Jesus in his holy place, walking among the lampstands. You know what the lampstands and the lamps represent? Represents his church, represents us. Did you know that God walks in and through our lives and he looks into your life? Do you know that it's Jesus that's whispering into your ear right now? For those of you who have rejected him, he's saying, hey, listen, you really need me. This is not a joke. This is not something you can discount, but you, you need me. You are hopeless without me, and, and you need me. That's, it's Jesus that's saying that. I, I want to assure you, your enemy would never, ever encourage you to commit your life to Jesus. I'm going to tell you that right now. You don't have to second guess that and go, well, I don't know if that's the devil or not. The devil's not going to do that. That just goes against, that's not on his team. That's unsportsmanlike conduct if you're on the enemy's team. You don't get to do that, all right? That's Jesus. And he's walking among 
uh, the lampstands. Someone says, you know, I don't, I don't, the Old Testament, man, I don't, we don't need that today because we live in the New Testament. Well, I just want to tell you something. You don't understand what the high priest does until you look at the Old Testament. I have to read the Old Testament to understand what the high priest's job was. And, and when I understand the high priest's job, I understand what Jesus is doing today. He's doing the high priest's job. He's interceding for us. He's making sacrifice for us. He's speaking on our behalf. He's communicating to us. He's telling us God's truth and God's word. He's encouraging us to put our lives in harmony with God's will because it's absolutely the best. Revelation chapter 1 is a picture of that. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 is known as the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. I'm not going to go in depth, but let me just tell you this. There were more than seven churches when John the Revelator wrote this down. There were more than seven churches. So why these seven? Well, the number seven is important to God. It's the number of completion. It's the number of perfection. And so these seven churches represent all of the church throughout all the ages, all right? Each one of these churches, they were picked out in particular because each of one of them would represent a church. That first church represents the church during the, the age of the apostles, the earliest church. Then the next church is at the next age. The next church is during the dark age. The next church is the persecuted church and so forth. And you'll see that those seven churches, if you look at the history of the church, every one of those seven churches, matter of fact, perfectly typifies the church during that age. So you have Revelation chapter 1, Jesus, high priest. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, God's showing you the history of the church and the future of the church. These seven churches found in that. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, something crazy happens. I like crazy stuff. Do you like crazy stuff? Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 says this. And let me just say this. Write this down. Be prepared. Live prepared, rather. Live prepared. Fill in your blank. Live prepared, because I'm about to buzz right past it. This is a drive-by blank fill-in, all right? Just fill it in. <laughs> Got to go back and look at it in a minute. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Remember Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is high priest. Chapter 2 and 3, the church throughout the history. Revelation 4, 1. Before Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, the church is mentioned 17 times. From Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, the church is not mentioned not a single time more on planet Earth. Why? Because it's not on planet Earth anymore. In fact, John, remember, he's a member of the church. Jesus said, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, after these things, remember the third division of the book of Revelation? It was this, write down the things that you've seen, the things which are, and what's the third division? Right. That's exactly right. That's where some of you are like, yes, we do. <laughs> Um, in Revela what we, what we found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, that final division is the things that will happen after these things. Remember? All right, now look at this. Revelation 4, verse 1 says, first three words. Do you see how it works? Do you see how God's so clear? Isn't it cool? So all of a sudden now, you know what? You had eternal Jesus, high priest. You had the church, age. That's this right here. And then something happens. And from this point forward, I'm going to tell you what happens from this point forward. This is the next division. When the Lord comes back for his church. All right. Just work with me, and I'm going to promise you this. We're going to talk about this for a whole month, and you're going to go, by the you get to the end of this, you're going to say, dude, I could have my own TV show. Um, <laughs> Revelation 4 1 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. Now, up to this point, John's on earth, and he's seeing all this stuff going on, and he's writing this stuff down. But then after this, he no longer can see what's happening with the church on the earth anymore. He has to go where? Got to go to heaven to see it. Why? Because the church isn't on earth anymore. That's just really important. Just remember, once you get to Revelation chapter 4, the book of Revelation now has two parallel stories. You have events that are happening in heaven, and you have events that are happening on earth. You have the church in heaven, and then you have hell on earth. That's what you have, all right? Just keep that in mind. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven, and the vo first voice which I heard sounded like a trumpet. Some people say, well, the church is not going to leave till the last trumpet. The voice sounds like a trumpet. You read it right there. Um, I'm just speaking to some people who have little isms. Anyway, speaking to me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place. What? Okay, now, it's, now we're in the last half of it. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. This is Paul speaking of this event. This is a crazy event. Let me tell you what's happening at this event. Jesus is going to return one day. I'm just going to give you a snapshot, all right? This is the Cliff's Notes. Jesus is going to return in the air. For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's what the Bible tells us. This is an incredible event. The, all of those who died knowing Jesus, their bodies are going to be put back together. Uh, some people, they, get, they come to me and say, Pastor Scott, should we cremate? I think it's a bad idea. We shouldn't be cremating, should we? I'm like, you know. Hey, listen, it's cheaper, all right? 
I go economy wherever I go. You know what I'm saying? I, I tell my folks, burn this old body up, dump it where you want to, because it's up to God to put it back together, right? You think when it goes in the box, it's all staying together? No. You're not seeing CSI when they dig those people back up? <laughs> If God can put Jell-O man back together, he can put Dusty dude back together. You know what I mean? Think about the first event. He made us out of a mud pie. You're good. Don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. Listen, there are people who were never even buried. We don't even know where they are. There are people who died at sea. There are soldiers whose bodies were blown up by bombs. There are people who burned to death. There are people in the World Trade Center. We never found them. There are people in shallow graves we didn't find. But God knows where they are. And one day, he will take their bodies, mine included if I'm dead, and he's going to put them back together. Now, I want to be clear here that the moment a believer, your life ends, your very next breath is an eternity in the presence of God. Your spirit is with the Lord. We're just talking about your body, okay? I tend to think that when he puts our bodies back together, they're thinner, more athletic, <laughs> I'm telling my family to lose some of the ashes, about, you know, a few pounds worth, can you please? I don't want to come back the fullness, you know? Just a little less of me, I'll be good with that. But anyway, here's what's going to happen. The Lord's going to come back. He's going to come back in the air. He's not physically at this time coming to the earth. He's going to meet us in the air. The Bible says, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's what the Bible says. So what's going to happen is there's going to be this event where God's going to come and he's going to call forth all those who have died in Christ and their bodies are going to be put back together. Someone says, why do the dead in Christ, why does God raise them first? I like the old time preacher who said they had six feet further to go. I don't know, but they get to rise first, all right? But then there's a generation, dig this, that's going to be here to see this happen. There's going to be a generation of Jesus followers that are going to be here to see this happen and they're going to be called home. This event is known as our blessed hope. It's also known as the Great Reunion Day. It's that incredible event where mom and child and brother and sister and mother and father and are going to be reunited together. No more separation. This is an incredible day. This is not a day to be feared. This is a day we celebrate. I assure you, preachers of years gone by, Christians of years gone by, they longed for this day. They look forward to this day. They were excited about this day. It's a very significant event. It, it displays for certain that Jesus is a deliverer. And he's going to deliver his church home. Now, incidentally, at the same time that that's happening, hell's going to break loose on earth. And God has a judgment that happens there. Now, I know there's some people who say, well, Scott, hold on a second. You've got these arguments, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, whatever. Here's what I'll say to this. This is seven years of God judging world organizations, world people groups, um, and religious organizations for rejecting his son, Jesus. Why would you judge the one organization that's been saying that you're who you say you are? You know, your kid did the right thing. Why would you punish them? It'd be like grounding your kid for cleaning their room. That's a weird parent. God's not a weird parent. He's a pretty incredible parent. So this judgment's going to come. We'll spend time talking about that. But let's, let's, let's read this together. Um, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Do you see it again, that trumpet and the shout and all that that's going on? I mean, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Um, I just gave you a little bit of tidbits in your outline, and you ought to write this down. I think it's kind of cool. Jesus only shouts three times in all of the Bible. Look it up. Three times. Only three times does Jesus shout. Matter of fact, he cried in John chapter 11, verse 43. Remember, he was outside Lazarus' tomb. Remember, he had this buddy named Lazarus who had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Remember, Lazarus died. Remember, Jesus hesitated, let Lazarus be good and dead, and he got there. Remember, he's outside the tomb, and Lazarus' sister is there, and he says, move the stone off the tomb. And, and she's like, no way, dude. That dude stinks by now. That's what she said. Um, she, even several days, and on a, it's summer, <laughs> you know. Um, so, no, let's don't. And, and he says, just move it away. And they moved the stone away, and Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come forth. And when he did, Lazarus got up from the dead. And he no longer was dead. He no longer had a smell. He walked out alive. That's an event that happened. 
Jesus shouted. It was on the cross as well in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 52. Only I'm only using portions of that in your outline. But it says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep. The Bible also says that Jesus, at the time of the rapture and, and the resurrection, Jesus is going to shout. Incidentally, every time Jesus shouts, people get up from the dead, which is kind of cool. Every time he shouts, he's going to shout in this day. We're all going to shout. You know what I'm saying? I'm scared of heights. <laughs> Mine's going to be part fear and excitement. You know? Oh, I don't know what that looks like. Something else. Let me read this final thing and we're done. 2 Peter 3, 10 and 11. This is talking about the ultimate. And we're actually fast forwarding. And, and I'm going to come back to all these things. But we're fast forwarding to the, to the very end of this kind of timeline. That's what Peter's talking about. But I think it fits anywhere on the timeline. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? How, do you, how should we live? As we look at this timeline, as we consider the person of Christ, how should we be living? And by the way, it matters how we live. It matters. So how should we live? Here's what he says. You ought to live holy and godly lives. Does that sound old-fashioned? Godly and holy. That's how we ought to live. You know why? Because my life affects other people's lives. My life affects how people, what they believe about this man. See, I can do something ridiculously stupid. You know what people will do? They'll blame it on Jesus. There's another one of those pastors. Can't keep his clothes on. Can't keep from stealing the money from the church. Doesn't really love Jesus. And you know what they'll do? Look at that silly stuff. That ain't no real deal. My actions reflect back on him. So do yours. See, the people around you, you may be the only Jesus they're seeing. And your life can either represent or misrepresent Jesus. So there's a way we ought to live. There's a way we ought to live. There's a way we ought to love people. There's a way we ought to receive people. Wouldn't it be great to have a, a crew of Christians going out into the world, loving people unconditionally? Stop being judgmental. Listen, it's not your job. Just so you know, it's not your job. Well, I just don't like the lifestyle that you're in. It doesn't matter. Nobody asks you. You're just, you're just called to love people and, and share the gospel. That's what your job is. Jesus said, all judgment has been given to me. We're, you don't have the capacity for judgment. That's not, that's not your job. You're going to love people, and you're going to represent Christ, and you're going to share Jesus with people. That's what you're going to do if you're going to do, do well. So how can I live prepared? Let me give you three things in particular. Number one, your worship needs to be on. We need, we need to be coming here together, singing songs. You need to be worshiping beyond this room in your life. There should be worship there. God's Word needs to be a part of your life. You need to have the Bible out. Some of you say, well, the Bible I got, I can't understand. Get a translation you can understand, all right? I just gave you a license. Get a translation you can understand. Listen, King James was a great guy, killed a bunch of people, but doesn't mean he's got the market cornered on the Bible, all right? So what you need to do is you need to get a translation. I'll recommend one, New Living Translation. Great translation of Scripture to read. Easy to read. You don't have to have somebody with a theological degree to describe it to you. You can read it and go, wow, that's really what happened. That's pretty cool. It'd be amazing to you. But you, you need to have God's word. And then ultimately, you need to be a witness. You don't have to understand everything about this timeline to tell people about Jesus. A simple, you know what? I once was blind, but now I see is a great story, isn't it? I once, this is once where I was. I don't have it all together, but here's where I once was. And, and then God came into my life. And I haven't arrived yet, but I'm going to tell you something. When I experienced his love, things changed. He's amazing. You have a story. Every person in this room has a story. For some of you, your story is going to start today. Here in just a second, you're going to make the decision that you no longer want to fix yourself because you can't. You've tried enough, haven't you? Made a commitment on Sunday, I'm going to get it together, and Monday by noon, you're already cussing. Come on. You can't do it. You can't do it. God didn't send Jesus because you might need him. God came in the form of Jesus and gave his life for you because you can't do it without him. It is impossible to please God without Jesus. And what a great opportunity you have today. You may that be that one person God's been waiting on. Aren't you glad you found a parking space? You made your way in because God wanted to talk to you today. So let's bow our heads together, and let's just be serious for just a second. I'm going to ask one simple question. And if you will be gut-level honest, I believe that God is going to give us some traction right now in this service, and I think we're going to see some cool things happen. 
that are way more important even than understanding every timeline. Are you sure? Well, let me ask it better this way. Is there anybody here? Nobody looking around, heads bowed, eyes closed. Is there anybody here right now? I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you just lift your hand for just a moment, is there anybody here right now that would say, man, I don't know for sure that I have a relationship with God through Jesus? Who would have the courage to lift their hand? So that's me. All right, just lift your hands. I'm seeing them. I'm seeing them over here, down the middle. Okay, on this side, I'm seeing those hands. Okay, okay, you can put your hands down. That's awesome. There's a way that you can know. See, God doesn't want you in doubt or in confusion. No, he wants you to know that you know that you know. Because see, and that's freedom. When you know that God possesses you and that that cannot be changed and you can never be lost, it gives you incredible freedom and strength. So if you want to do that and you want to know that for sure, let's, let's speak to God about it. Let's talk to God even right now. Silently, right there where you sit, why don't you talk to God right now? Just, just say something to God like this. Just silently. Just say this in your mind. Here's what you say. Just say this, say, God, I need you. And I believe I can trust you. I know that I can't, I can't do this on my own. But I need you in my life. So today, God, I put my life in your hands. I no longer want to be in control. I need you. I trust you, Jesus, that you died for me so that I might go free. In the days to come, God, teach me how to live. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. And most especially today, thank you for saving me offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunities you give us, God. Lord, we praise you and celebrate your presence. And for those who committed their life to you, God, we are most grateful. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen.